morning and welcome to Rexdale Alliance online service. My name is Ramona Loberg and it's my delight to host the service this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all mothers, stepmothers, grandmothers, aunts, and other women who love, care for, and influence those around them. We're glad that you joined us today. And so if you are new, you can find out more information about our church community on this Facebook page, or you can check out our website at rexdalealliance.ca. Our prayer is that during this time together, our Heavenly Father will speak words of love, of hope, and of peace to our thirsty souls. One way that that can happen is by engaging with one another throughout the service in the comment section, so please be sure to do so. This weekend, we have included some special messages and tributes for our mothers from some of the kids in our family ministries, so stay tuned for that. And later in the service, Pastor Dave pauses his series in Colossians to bring us a message of hope from the Book of Ruth. But first, we continue our journey through the Psalms, specifically Psalm 42, which Ashworthy Matthew will read shortly. As in many of the Psalms, the writer speaks to his troubled soul. He tells himself to remember the loving things that God has done and that God is still working within the troubles. Isn't that a good reminder for us today in these times? I encourage you to use the song links that are in the post to help you speak to your soul the truth about our Heavenly Father who loves and cares for us. Now, would you watch this clip from the Bible Project that further describes the themes of the collection of Psalms in Book 2? If you pay attention to the headings of the poems, you'll notice that at five places, your Bible translators have the heading Book 1, Book 2, Book 3, 4, and 5 at various points, and that these divide the book into five large sections. Now, the reason for this is that the final poem in each of those sections have a very similar ending that looks like an editorial edition. It reads something like, May the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever. Amen and amen. Book two opens with two poems that are united in their hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. And this is an image closely associated with the hope of the Messianic kingdom. Then book two closes with a poem that depicts the future reign of the Messianic king over all of the nation. This poem's really amazing because it echoes all these other passages from the prophets about the Messianic kingdom. And it concludes by saying that this king's reign will bring about the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to Abraham to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. Good morning, Rexdale. My name is Ashwati. Please listen as we read from Psalm 42. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go stand before him? Day and night I have only tears for food. While my enemies continually taunt me saying, where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowd of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my savior and my God. I hear the tumult of raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night, I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we have just read that our days depend on you. This year, today, during these uncertain times of a pandemic, we celebrate a Mother's Day like never before. We may not be able to celebrate with our families physically, but I pray that as we gather at our tables over video calls or even just with our own families, that we take this time to remember your love and to seek you, God, 
with a deep longing to understand you. On this Mother's Day, we specially pray for our mothers who are homeschooling their children. There are many struggles and challenges for dealing with children at various ages. Mothers may be tired and stressed from balancing the tasks of both work and home life. I pray that you bless us with an extra measure of patience, wisdom and maturity as we support our children's education. Give us the strength to provide firm boundaries when needed and to demonstrate our love unconditionally to them. We remember our single mothers in our community. Bless them with the strength that they need to fulfill the various roles in the lives of their families. I pray that you surround them with supportive people to encourage them. I pray for the women who are mother figures to families and friends around them. We thank and praise you, Lord, for them because they love and care for so many with great compassion. We are also aware that a day like today could be painful for some. We pray that you comfort those who are hurting. May the peace of your presence cover their minds and thoughts. If we are troubled and discouraged, may your spirit help us to take our minds off of this present situation and fill us with hope of the times to come. Help us to lay our burdens at the feet of Jesus. May we loosen our grip on our problems and lessen our need to control. Help us to keep our eyes on you, Lord. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Oh uh -huh.
Hello, Rexdale Church family. My name is Teresa Catania, and I'm one of the Sunday school teachers for grades 7 and 8, as well as a member of the Family Ministries leadership team. Can you believe it is May already? Time seems to fly and stand still at the same time. And today is a very special day where we want to celebrate all the mothers, grandmothers, and people who act like mothers. We appreciate Fiona and Sophie's gift of song to bless mothers, and we have another tribute to thank God for who he made you to be, because you are loved, and we want to honor you. So whether you are near to your mother or keeping a safe distance like me, happy Mother's Day, Mom. Enjoy. I'm Noah. I'm Hannah. I'm Leah. I'm my mom because she knows a lot about me and I can tell her anything. I just haven't told her about my first kiss. If you're watching my mom, show me. I love my mom because she takes care of me. I can confide in her. Sometimes she may get angry, but I still love her. I love my mom so much. She is so kind and caring, and she helps me with my homework. I love you to the moon and back. We love, love you, Mom. mom. Good morning, friends. Together with Ramona, I too would like to extend my welcome to you this morning and say how very glad I am that we were able to gather, even in this way, to worship Jesus. He remains the very rock upon which we build our lives, a sure foundation in the valleys and storms of life, still the Lord of the winds and the waves, and still with the authority to say, peace, be still. Can I start by saying, how very glad I was to see some of the children this morning. Thank you for honoring our mothers and participating in our service in that way. You've reminded us of the special and great value of women in the body of Christ. So whether you are a grandmother, a mother, an aunt, a sister, a friend, or a mentor, happy Mother's Day. You are cherished and appreciated. This morning, as we gather as a church family, there is much for which to be grateful, and there is much for which we can grieve. Jesus holds these two aspects of our lives in tension and in his hands. And in a few moments, I'm going to invite you to pray with me to our ever-loving, ever-present God. But before I do that, I have a few opportunities that I'd like to share with you. Firstly, a special message from Pastor Solange to the Rexdale kids. She wants you to know that we haven't forgotten about the Share Hope cans that you have collecting funds for our friends in Mali. We know that you can't bring them to Sunday school, but would you ask your parents to drop them at the church this week? You can bring them to the office door on Islington Avenue, ring the bell, drop them in the bin provided, and there's a special bag for you to pick up. Here are the pickup days. Monday, May the 11th, or Thursday, May the 14th, from 9 to 12 in the morning, or 1 to 4 in the afternoon. Some of the young adults and I have been meeting online on Thursday nights at 7 p.m., and last week we started a series on prayer. So this is an invitation to you, if you are a young adult, to join us for this opportunity to explore some of the gifts and challenges of a growing prayer life with God. 
If you'd like to participate, you can find the link to the Zoom meeting on our WhatsApp group. I usually do that and post it on a Thursday afternoon. And if you aren't a part of our WhatsApp group, then please email me at the address that you see on the screen now. We would love to have you. Lastly, if you would like prayer, our prayer team is available to you after the nine o'clock service this morning. Please make use of this opportunity by clicking the link, which will take you to the team. And this information will be made available again at the end of the service. As we pause now for a few minutes, I invite you to lift these specific prayer items to Jesus, our High Priest, ever interceding for us at the Father's right hand. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence and embrace the gift of it in our lives and in the world at large. We acknowledge that you sustain our very lives with your creative and loving power and that you are always at work redeeming, healing, and calling us deeper into intimacy with you. Today we give thanks for the spirit of motherhood that continues to shape our lives and our world. Thank you, Father, for our mothers, both biological and spiritual. We honor them today and ask for your blessing, protection, and guidance to be on each one who holds the responsibility of caring for the next generation. This is the perfect time to thank you for the safe delivery of baby Paul born to Vechka and Meng. Even though he was early, thank you that he is healthy and that they are both doing well. Lord Jesus, while we celebrate with one, 
we are also able to grieve with another, and my heart aches for the many in our church family who have experienced significant losses over the last few weeks and months. In addition, we remember the many who are gravely ill, Sri, Melodia, and John Neufeld, all who need your touch, your healing, your compassion and mercy. Thank you that your word is filled with the promises that they will not endure these hardships alone and that you are present in the valleys of their lives. As they seek you, Lord, would you give them the desire of their hearts? God, we keep our eyes fixed on you during this strange and uncertain time. We ask you to continue to direct the decisions of our government and other world leaders during this pandemic. We have confidence that you will redeem this time for your glory. So help us to pay attention to the voice of the Spirit within us, clarify our mission, quicken our hearts for your gospel, and enlarge our capacity and love for you and our neighbors as ourselves. We are your people, Jesus. You are our shepherd, and we love you, we worship you, we follow you. Amen.
Well, let me add my greetings to mothers today. It's my hope that as we continue in our worship experience that you will come to appreciate the sacred place that you hold in God's family plan. Today we are going to take a break from our study of the book of Colossians so that I might speak especially to mothers, but hopefully from this conversation that I will have with mothers, we all will gain an understanding of uh, God's heart of love for us. Today we're going to look at a mother and daughter-in-law actually, who in a time when normality seemed to escape them, they discovered that God was sufficient. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we're grateful today for our mothers. We appreciate them. We thank you for the way that you love us through them. And so we pray that you will encourage them today. And as we look into this story from the Old Testament, that you will allow us to see how you shape us and work on our behalf in a way that demonstrates, in some ways, your mother's heart for us. And so we'll thank you for what you accomplished in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of my career moves happened when our third son was about ready to leave for university. His two older brothers were already in their undergraduate programs, and since he wasn't quite sure what degree program he wanted to pursue, he enrolled at a Christian college for a one-year spiritual formation course. The change in my career necessitated a move to a new house in a new community. We moved into the house in August, a couple of weeks before our son headed to Western Canada where the college was located. Upon completing his first semester, he returned home for Christmas break, only home wasn't quite the same. One morning he came into the kitchen and blurted out to his mother, Mom, this is supposed to be home, but if you asked me to go to the store to pick up some milk, I wouldn't have a clue where to go. He paused for a moment and then said, don't you wish you could just close your eyes and everything would go back to normal? The story that frames my talk to you this morning begins with a man by the name of Elimelech moving his family from the familiar surroundings of Bethlehem to the distant country of Moab. The events that unfolded from this, for this displaced household would cause me to wonder if at some point Someone would have expressed the wistful musings of our son and said, don't you wish you could just close your eyes and everything would go back to normal? Why Elimelech would choose Moab as the new place of residence for his family is a bit of a mystery. The people of Moab were descendants of the incestuous relationship of Lot with his daughters. They were anything but friendly to the Israelis. I suppose it could be likened today to a Jewish father intentionally moving his family into Palestinian territory, or perhaps closer to home, someone from Leaf Nation moving to the rogue nation of the senators. Things did not go well for Elimelech and his family in Moab. First, Elimelech died, leaving Naomi and her two sons to fend for themselves in a foreign land. Then Malon and Kilion, Elimelech's sons married Moabite women, a practice forbidden by Jewish tradition. After this, both Malon and Kilian died. Now Naomi was left with two daughters-in-law and zero hope for a secure future. Her longing for some stability to, go, to return to her life caused her to make a decision to return back home to Bethlehem. She declared her decision to her daughters-in-law and then realizing the tug that her heart felt when her husband moved her away from family and friends to an unfamiliar place, told them to go back to their mother's homes from there and, and, and where they could start again. One of the daughters-in-law took her at her word and left, while the other, Ruth, insisted on accompanying Naomi back to Bethlehem. When Naomi realized that she was not going to be successful in dissuading Ruth, she agreed for her to come along. The two of them started out on a journey that would lead to a legacy of anything but normal. 
Stephen Covey, in his book, First Things First, argues that there are four essential qualities that should fill up the pages of our lives. They are to live, to love, to learn, and to leave a legacy. Indeed, these fundamental experiences would unfold in Ruth's life, but they would first of all be shaped by a relationship that would end up defining her. When our children were in their 20s, there was a relational term going around that was common to the 20-somethings crowd. It was DTR, meaning define the relationship. Usually it was used by those who were attempting to discover the parameters of a romantic involvement, especially when there was some uncertainty by one of the parties. The uncertain person, who we will call the DTRE, DTRE rather, might say to the other called the DTRer, I think it's time that we had a little DTR chat. The mere mention of this term could send chills down the spine of the DTRer because there is no such thing as a little DTR chat. Ruth was intent on having a DTR chat with Naomi. Although there were no romantic feelings linked to the relationship, there definitely was a love connection. There was the obvious affection that Ruth felt for Naomi, but there was a deeper connection that was forming in Ruth, brought on by Naomi's trust relationship with God. Captured in Ruth's heart was the call for some godly DTR. In the midst of her uncertainty, and with the very real possibility that her journey could lead her nowhere when it came to a preferred future, Ruth was about to make the amazing discovery that with God, nowhere becomes now here. The defining characteristic of a relationship with God is the promise of his constant presence. And so, with a deep sense of appreciation for her mother-in-law and a growing longing to come to know her God, Ruth defines the relationship. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. The strength of relationship that defined Ruth is undoubtedly linked to what she had come to witness from Naomi's belief in God. It is clear that both Ruth and her sister-in-law had a deep personal love for Naomi. What distinguished Ruth's connection with Naomi was the pull of a godly life. Certainly, Naomi's faith journey was not without its struggles. At times, Naomi was convinced that God had left her nowhere. At one point, she even proposed that her friends no longer call her Naomi, but call her by the name of Mara, citing the fact that God had made her life bitter. Naomi means pleasant, while Mara means bitter. However, the proposed name change didn't stick because to all those around her, Naomi gave off the pleasant aroma of a life lived under the conscious awareness of God's presence. And so, in the midst of uncertainty and unfamiliarity, Naomi embraced a faith that went beyond every inclination to abandon hope, and in doing so, would lead Ruth into making the amazing discovery of how God transforms every normal inclination to abandon hope into his grand design of redemption. When I was first working on this talk, my wife asked me how I was doing. There were some things that she had in mind that could be imp impacted by where I was at with my preparation. I responded to her by saying, okay. She looked at me a little sideways and replied, now that was unusual. Usually I can tell by your facial expression and tone of voice if okay means that it is not coming together for you and I have a long wait, or okay means that you are nearly done. But this okay was much more subtle. I made some comment about not wanting her to think that she always could totally figure me out. There may be occasions when people ask how we are doing in our relationship with God that we say, 
okay. And by this we mean that things are progressing along, but may not be where we would like them to be. This could have been Naomi's response if asked. However, when okay defines your relationship with God, know this, God has not changed his facial expression or the tone of his voice towards you. There may be a number of things about God that you cannot figure out, but, it is, but this is sure, as the DTR-er in the relationship, he is committed to being now here when it seems as if you are growing distant from him. When Ruth looked into Naomi's eyes, she could see that although OK may define where she is at in her faith journey at this present time, it would not be the place where she would stay. Naomi would not be content with a godly DTR of proximity and no intimacy. The message is obvious. There comes a point in our faith journeys when we must stop to have the DTR chat with God. How do we define the relationship? How does it match God's desire for closeness? What do people really see when they look deeply into our eyes? The importance of this chat will be crucial for any who want to go the distance with God. When Ruth arrived at, in Bethlehem with Naomi and started to pick up the pieces of her life in her new location, the influence of Naomi's walk with God became instructional. Prompted by a practicality that matched her affection for Naomi and her blossoming relationship with God, Ruth was moved to embrace a faith with practical implications. The provision of God for the poor, the weak, and the disadvantaged is evident throughout Scripture. In Old Testament times, it was a legal obligation for Jewish farmers to leave behind a remnant of the harvest for the poor to collect for food. Ruth and Naomi arrived back in Bethlehem at harvest time. It is apparent that Ruth soon became aware of the opportunity to gather grain because she said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Those of you who are familiar with the story of Ruth will understand the importance of the introduction of Boaz into the narrative. This will become more evident to any who are unfamiliar with the storyline momentarily. What is worth noting just now is the response of Ruth to the need she and Naomi faced. They came to town empty-handed. However, Ruth did not allow their misfortune to blind her to the opportunity of doing something practical to relieve their condition. In an act of love and respect for Naomi, she took the initiative to go and gather grain. Here we see the tangible element connected with faith. Although we are called upon to trust God for all of life and salvation, there is a personal responsibility we all shoulder in experiencing the provision of God's promises. We have an obligation to demonstrate our faith connection with God by taking due responsibility in positioning ourselves to experience his provision in our lives. By gathering up her garments and heading out to the harvest fields, Ruth did her part in following through with her understanding of what God intended and encountered firsthand the results of taking him at his word. Of all of the fields she could have chosen to work, God led her to the field of a family relative that would end up bringing Ruth and Naomi under his protective care. While I was ending my high school education and looking to discover what God's will might be for my life. I had a pastor who wisely said to me in my search for God's leading, you can't steer a docked ship. In other words, take some action and see where God may take you. When it comes to living by faith, there is a time for waiting and a time for action. But waiting does not mean doing nothing. 
Even when we wait, we still engage in actively doing what we know God intends for us, trusting open, openly in his promise to care for us. Then with a conscious assurance that God has our back, we step out to discover that faith which acts on the basis of God's love is rewarded with God's gracious provision. From an act of faith riveted in her love for Naomi and her growing understanding of how God loves and provides for her, Ruth now takes the most crucial risk of faith yet when she lies down at the feet of her Redeemer. In Old Testament Jewish society, the solidarity of the family and the care of family members was a dominant obligation for God's covenant people. So much so that a special arrangement was instituted for families in distress, either through the death of the family leader or from financial reversal. Provision was made for a family redeemer, typically the closest living relative, to perform the duty of relieving the anguish of the affected family member and restoring their well-being. The importance of Ruth finding the right field to gather grain now becomes strategic. As Ruth moved out in active faith, God directed her choice. The owner of the field, Boaz, was a family member of Naomi's husband. Based on this relationship, Naomi instructed Ruth to place herself in a position where Boaz would be called upon to fulfill his redemptive duty. In keeping with Jewish tradition at the time, Ruth was to take the initiative to show her interest in having Boaz fulfill his role as the family redeemer by marrying her. This could be accomplished, Naomi told Ruth, by going to him where he slept after processing the day's harvest and lying down at his feet. Ruth followed her mother-in-law's instruction. And so the account indicates after Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain uh, there and, and, and fell asleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. The scripture account goes on to indicate that Boaz did indeed fulfill his responsibility as the family redeemer, married Ruth, and brought Naomi into their home. The climax to the story of Ruth is that she found her redeemer, one to care for her and provide for a secure future. As such, it becomes a picture to us of what Christ Jesus offers to us. He provides redemption from a life lived away from God to all who position themselves at his feet and learn to live in a trust relationship with him. To make someone your redeemer is fundamentally a choice of being with him. And so it is that the story of Ruth sets before us our primary faith decision, to choose to be with Jesus, to be so intent on living in his presence that we put aside our pride and with a surrendered humility invite him to cover us all over with his redemptive provision. Ruth's relationship with her family redeemer led to a unique legacy of faith that was against all odds. When Boaz brought Ruth into his home as his wife and made love to her, God enabled Ruth to become pregnant. She gave birth to a son who was given the name of Obed. Obed grew, got married, and had a son named Jesse. Jesse, in turn, had a son named David, who became Israel's most celebrated king and most distinguished forerunner in the birth line of the Messiah. Matthew acknowledges Ruth's role in, his distinguished, in this distinguished legacy in his gospel account of the genealogy of Jesus. In a list dominated by the names of fathers, Ruth receives honorable mention as the mother of Obed. 
from the position of an outsider to a place of prominence in God's redemptive plan for humanity. Ruth's bold faith gained for her the greatest legacy any mother could ever hope for, laying a faith foundation that would lead to God's purposes being fulfilled in generations to come. Faith's legacy is formed by what one commentator calls the ethic of allegiance. When trust becomes the defining spirit of the follower of Jesus, undivided loyalty is the accompanying outcome. This then becomes the representative, representative feature of our relationship with God. When our oldest son was in his last year of high school, my wife asked him what I thought to be a rather daring question. Many of our son's friends in school and on his sports teams had gotten heavily into the alcoholic drug and illicit, illicit sex scene. He had been exposed to their involvements through the parties he attended, often as the designated driver, and, and by just hanging out with them. Janie asked him what had kept him from getting caught up in their choices. He responded by saying, Mom, I look at you and Dad and the life choices you have made. You are happy. Besides, your decisions have been good for us. Why would I risk losing all of this by choosing differently? We were humbled and somewhat surprised by the rationale that he gave. I learned from his response that faith's legacy that will stand against all odds is shaped more by what is observed than by what is said. And with this awareness, I have come to see how vital it is to take the time to have the defining relationship chat with God and to have it often. So let me ask you, have you had this conversation? What was the outcome? Do you need a refresher chat? What do you see as essential for defining the relationship you intend to have with God. Then I suppose there could be some listening today and your dilemma stems from, the, from feeling on the outside looking in when it comes to living in the reality of God's protective care. You are working hard to make your life come together, but as you have listened to the story of Ruth, it suddenly dawned on you that you have been toiling in the wrong field. Life has become a wasteland for you and you want to see it changed. My proposal for you would be the same as Naomi gave to Ruth. Seek out the Redeemer. Lay intentionally at his feet and invite Jesus to cover you all over with his saving grace. In the end, Jesus has taken the initiative to provide for our redemption from misplaced values, and he invites us to rest in his abiding presence and live in the security of his care. He instructs us on first things by calling us to live free in him, to love deeply, to learn the truth, and to leave a legacy of faith. And so as I wrap up today, let me give a few takeaways for mothers and those they love. When normalcy becomes unpredictable, allow a confident trust in God to be expressed as the new normal. This happens when we define our relationship with God by intimacy above provision. What I mean by that is that we trust God for who he is above and beyond what he does then faith brings strength and hope into relationships. Relationships can and do get complicated. Belief in God's goodness and the personal worth of those with whom we share life together are foundational factors for entering into relations of mutuality and wholeness. Next, faith has its rewards. When we develop rhythms of faith in our lives, we pick up the dance to the heartbeat of God. The move to uncertain drumbeats pales in comparison to the music of the song of heaven, making our spirits light and our movements 
easy. The current focus on the Psalms and the opening stanzas of our worship times is intended to establish in us the rhythms of God's heart for us. Then lastly, look at the one thing that remains constant, the one remaining constant in life. As the writer of Hebrews wrapped up his instruction on how the gospel he preached had replaced the sacrificial system of the past, he wanted his readers to know that when doubts or unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with the new way would seem to overwhelm, there was one constant that never changed and that would hold them securely in the way they were following. Here is what he told them. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This truth is still as real and powerful as when it was first given. It remains the one constant for us in the midst of our quest for normal. And so as I leave you today, allow the unchanging presence of Jesus to enrich your relationships, and especially your relationships with your wives and mothers. Be present to them today, whether through acts of love or through fond memories. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the loving mother heart of God and the strengthening companionship of the Holy Spirit bring peace, hope, and joy to you. Amen.